name's Ursula and this is the channel where I interview people who have achieved financial independence. If you enjoy listening then please do subscribe. So today I'm speaking to Barney, aka the escape artist, who has become a bit of a celebrity in the fire world. He's well known for achieving financial independence at the age of 43 and for his blog, The Escape Artist, which we'll come back to later. But first of all, tell us a bit about yourself, Barney. What did you do before you achieved financial independence? Morning. Hi. So I used to work in finance, I originally trained as an accountant, and then what, so I, I used to be like a baby auditor, auditing companies. Um, but then I moved to work in corporate finance, um, so I kind of spent the last twenty years running up to when I quit in two thousand and thirteen, um, working in finance. Um, so what I used to do was. Um, working corporate finance, valuing companies and advising on um, buying and selling companies. And when did you sort of first become kind of interested in financial independence? I mean, obviously, if you've, with quite a lot of people I've spoken to who have achieved financial independence or who are in the fire world, it seems to be kind of quite a common theme, sort of working in the city or, or working in the sort of financial services industry in in some respect um but what kind of sparked your interest in the sort of financial world um but also in the idea of that you could become financially free yeah i've always been kind of um super interested in sort of uh saving um and i i think i've always had a little bit of a kind of hang up about poverty and ending up being homeless so it's kind of a bit weird but when i was um when I was 11 in 1981, my parents um, had borrowed the biggest mortgage they possibly could. And um, interest rates went to 17% back in 1981. And so that was kind of an uncomfortable time in our household finances. And so like, you know, that year, uh, the holiday got canceled and the newspaper got canceled and my, my dad stopped buying beer and had to like, you know, brew his own horrible kind of homebrew stuff. And so I, I think I just picked up from that time that debt was a bit of a scary thing. And I, I think I just kind of joined the dots up to like, if, you, if you're in debt, then ultimately, um, you know, the bank can take your house away from you. So I just kind of, um, I, you know, and then a couple of years after that, you had, I was, I was you know, whatever, 13, 14, you're watching the TV and you're seeing pictures of stockbrokers and mobile folks, those kind of old school, chunky mobile phones and buy, sell and all the rest of it. And, and I'm like, hold on, they look like they've got money. <laughs> you know? uh, that looks interesting. Uh, that certainly looks better than like being um, homeless and losing your house to the bank. So I think that kind of sparked an unusual interest in money. In me. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting and if I'm being honest that's something that I can really relate to because it's it's a bit irrational because I don't come from a uh, a poor background I come from a fairly bog standard uh, middle class sort of background but uh, I've always had this sort of anxiety about money um, and also yeah probably a bit of a fear of a fear of losing it and a sort of a fear of not having enough and I think um, it probably comes down to the fact that, and I was, I must've been very young when this happened, probably eight or nine, but my, um, my dad, uh, used to run a, his own business. He's retired now. And I think at one point the business was going through a very difficult time and I didn't really quite click what's happening. I was a bit too young to understand exactly what was happening, but mm -hmm. I just remember kind of one night him coming back and sort of opening up the champagne because I think that day had sort of been a, a do or die day yes and I subsequently learned that I I think we could have potentially lost an awful lot yes. and it's interesting because it, at the time you know I was a child I didn't really think that much about it but now looking back on it I think that probably did spark some sort of like you say realization that actually 
you know, yeah, the bank can take your house. Yes. So we don't have necessarily the security that, you know, that, that, that we think you do. So um, I think it's really interesting that you say that. And I, I know that you've spoken, I think, with Ken from The Humble Penny about the role that fear can play what what do you because i'm i'm in two minds as to whether sort of fear and anxiety about sort of poverty is 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 a good thing but you have kind of clearly used it as a way of sort of propelling yourself forward and achieving financial independence absolutely and if i was if i was being kind of controversial and if i was being critical of the financial independence movement. I, I think it would be, it, it sometimes ignores the fact that, you know, people like you and me, you know, what, what gets us going is fear. Um, it gets us, you know, what gets us going is a kind of fear of poverty. And that's a hell of a motivator. It's a hell of a motivator. I mean, fear is the most powerful primal motivator. There's nothing more primal than kind of seeing a tiger being terrified and running away. And so, um, you know, fear is the most powerful emotion for prompting uh, action. And my, the question I sometimes ask myself is, if you're not born with that, or, or it wasn't instilled in you as part of your childhood, how easy is it for you to kind of turn into one of these sort, sort of super savers? So, so in that sense, you could say that people like you and me have an unfair advantage because we we kind of have had that plugged into our operating system, that fear, that motivation. And how easy is that for someone that never had that as part of their childhood, you know, to in install it themselves? Yeah, exactly. And also I think your, your money blueprint and how your parents were with money can be really influential. So my parents were always um, frugal, but without being mean, you know, we still, um, you know, went out for, for dinner and things, but they were very careful with money. Um, they weren't showy with money um, and they invested. And I remember sometimes when I was younger and I'd sort of see other people with kind of flashier things and I'd think, oh, why don't we have that? And it's only now as I've grown older that I've kind of realised that they were investing for the long term. But I know of, of other people whose families didn't have that sort of mindset um, and they literally can't save money. You know, they, they really struggle even with the concept of saving money, let alone investing it and thinking about how they can become financially free. Now, that's not to say that obviously people can't change and that, you know, we, we can't better ourselves. But I think it does definitely, definitely play a role uh, in, in how you view money um, and the extent to which you can, you can sort of accumulate wealth in a sort of a, in a you know, in, in a sensible and, and reasoned way. But yeah. I'm interested in when did you sort of even become aware of the idea of financial independence and sort of start putting the, the dots together and think, well, hang on a second. If I save and invest, you know, a certain amount every month, technically within X amount of years, I might not have to work anymore. Yeah, I, I kind of... I invented it. I invented that idea <laughs> and in the sense that I, I had to kind of, I, I stumbled across it myself. And then I only later on did I stumble across, you know, all these blogs and all these books and all this stuff. And it's like, Oh, other people invented it long before me, it turns out. Um, but I do, you know, I do remember, I, I remember at college, at university, I lived on um, like 3000 pounds a year. Um, and then I remember just thinking when I got my first job in, in London uh, and I started on 12 and a half thousand pounds a year, it was very paradoxical because I realized I was poorer uh, earning 12 and a half thousand pounds a year than I was living as a student um, on 3,000 pounds. I mean, I just had, it was bizarre, but I just had less kind of free cash flow to going out. It was, it was very weird. I just thought, oh, it's surely if you, quadruple your income like you must be you must be a lot better off right and it just didn't work out that way because obviously you know I was I was renting a flat in London um, and I had to buy like um, you know suits and shirts and stuff for, for work yeah the, the cost of work the, the cost of work really you know really kicked in because 
um, I'm in an, I'm in this kind of um, I'm working in the city you know it's the world's leading accountancy firm and like so you kind of feel you have to dress for the part and yet you're on <laughs> you're twelve and a half thousand pounds a year so uh, the the cost of work does seem quite a lot of money at, at that point but anyway the, the, my point was it's like why am I broke when I'm I'm on four times what I was last year and it just occurred to me well look. If I could have a pot of money, let's say a hundred thousand pounds, and I could earn ten percent a year on that, that would be an income of ten thousand pounds a year, and I could live off that in in some shape or form. And so, I just kind of I, those numbers were just sort of uh, floating around in my head, and I just thought that that must be possible. That must be. A thing that must be a way that one could live uh, if you could just find a way to get the stash together. Um, I also just very vaguely had this ill-formed idea that I would work in finance until the age of 40 and then I would kind of downshift and buy a little sort of small holding kind of good life style. You're probably you're too young to remember good life. But no I know it I, yeah I know it. Um, but just the idea that you, you know, you would uh, have this little kind of, not a farm, but a, like a little a paddock or something and you'd grow in a vegetable garden and, and, and a small holding. And you could just kind of downsize and, and, and raise children in that, in that sort of blissful environment. So I kind of had that idea in my head. You know, that's in my 20s. And then kind of scroll forward um, to when I was... 30, I did find a book um, called Invest in Yourself, which is an American self-help slash financial independence book, but not a very well-known one. And it just talked about all these concepts like, you know, obviously the power of compound interest, but, but, the, but how much is enough? You know, it, it talked about how much is enough and it talked about downshifting and it talked about, you know, kind of getting off the consumer treadmill. So that, that book, I don't even, it's not even the best book on, it's nowhere near the best book on financial independence, but for whatever reason, it was the book that introduced me to that, that set of concepts. Yeah, I think it's, I think probably what you say resonates with a lot of people, particularly people who work in fairly high powered jobs in the city. And I've, I've people that I've spoken to or articles that I've read where they sort of say, right, you know, I'm going to, um, the plan is anyway to earn a, a lot of money, save and invest it well, and then sort of downsize at the age of, you know, 40 and, and perhaps leave London and, and go to a cheaper area. But how many people actually do that and don't sort of succumb to lifestyle inflation and sort of the consumerism and, and just generally the sort of the, the fear of, of, of being different? Um, you know, I... I, I I went to a, I remember, um, you know, you used to have, to, when you were kind of networking, awful word, um, in the city, we used to go to like lunches with, with lawyers. And uh, I remember going to this lawyer's lunch and the lawyers there were scandalized. They were absolutely scandalized because one of their partners, one of their young partners had, had hit 40 and he just quit. And he'd just gone to live on a small holding in New Zealand. And they were all like, how has he done that? How has he done that? Like, why has he done that? Like, and they were kind of up in arms about it. And I was thinking, good for him. Like, <laughs> well done, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, when you were in that industry, was there not quite a lot of pressure to sort of keep up with the Joneses um, and sort of spend in, in line of, in, in line of kind of what your colleagues were doing? You know, I'm thinking of all the, the drinks out and, and all that sort of oh. kind of stuff. Uh, the drinks out were unbearable. So, you know, um, the drink, the worst thing was the drinks out with the other kind of people on my level, like the other sort of senior people. And they're just talking about, you know, their, the latest car they bought or the latest this, the latest that. And I was just like, I can't listen to this crap. You know, so I, it was, for me, I just would make my excuses and leave as quickly as possible and like go and get drunk with the juniors. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a lot more fun to be fair um so what i'm kind of gleaning from that is that it's pretty important to have a fairly independent mindset in order to achieve 
what you what you have achieved what kind of values and mindset did you have to adopt and do you think it's a sort of important in order to achieve financial independence yes well great question um you know the there is an independence of thought required there's no, no doubt about that so you know I, I just see the people that that kind of do this and, and and walk that path they tend to have some air some element of contrarianism in them they t tend to be kind of rational skeptical people that are are prepared to kind of look at the evidence and change their minds and not just blindly follow any one kind of ideology um, and so, you know, there's definitely an element of being prepared, to, you know, you have to be prepared to swim against the tide. And, you know, again, I, if I'm psychoanalyzing myself, I remember, you know, I remember very early when I was at primary school being just struck very powerfully by, by what we learned about World War One and the trenches. And I just remember, I it was like an amazing sense of perspective, like, oh, if it weren't for an accident of a few few decades, that could have been me, age 18, up to my waist in mud and rats and body parts and bombshells. Um, and when you kind of realize that, you don't take things for granted. Um, it's very grounding, it gives you a sense of perspective. But the, the other message I kind of took from that is, is sometimes you have to stand up for what you believe. Some, sometimes you have to fight for what you believe. And, and one of my, kind of one of, the, one of my little phrases that I remind myself of is, it's better uh, to live on your feet than die on your knees. And so I, you know, it does take an element of unplugging to, to sort of quit a job and walk away from that, that security, that, that safety, you know, I used to have private health insurance. I used to, you know, have a good salary. I used to have sick pay. I used to have all these things that provide security. But ultimately, I think it's better, as I say, to die on your feet and live on your knees. So there comes a point where you have to, where you have to say, I've got enough. Um, now I need to be a bit braver. Yeah, I think there's some really great points you made there. I think you're definitely right about the, you know, how much is enough because I think where people tend to go wrong is they're not really kind of analyzing, they're kind of analyzing perhaps what they want rather than what they absolutely desperately need. And they're not actually looking at kind of, well, what do I actually spend every month and what of what I'm spending actually adds value to my life. Um, and it's very easy and, um, you know, we all, we all do it. I'm not saying I'm immune or perfect. I'm definitely not. Um, it is very easy to kind of look at what other people have and think, oh, you know, I need to buy the bigger house or, um, I live in London, so I don't really buy cars, but I know cars are quite a sort of a status symbol for, you know, a, a lot of people. I, well. I was lucky in that regard. I knew a lot of very wealthy people that had awful, awful, awful lifestyles. T terrible unhappy unhealthy lifestyles and so for me it wasn't that much of a of a leap of imagination to realize oh maybe there's more to life than money yeah i mean you know i could tell you some stories about you know like wealthy people whose life just kind of fell to pieces yeah and you know i i would look at, and i would look at some of the people higher up the chain than me and I would think, gosh, I mean, you are a, an incredible success um, from a career perspective, from an economic perspective. I don't want your life. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially, uh, you know, it's that question of how much are you willing to, to give up and how much of your life are you willing to get, give up? And there's one thing doing what you've done, which is working very hard in a high powered job for a set period of time you know, getting what you want and need out of it and then being able to, as you say, break out the prison camp. But if, if you're sort of not doing that and you're under a lot of stress all the time, you know, how much of a home life can you have? Um, let alone time with friends, family, um, you know, other activities which make life worthwhile. I also want to just quickly go back to a point that you made earlier 
about conformism because it's something that I've also picked up with people that I've met who are interested in the financial independence world is you're right they tend to be very independent thinkers and they tend to be people who think for themselves and I I am actually becoming a bit more concerned now than I think I ever have at the lack of independent or the lack of critical thinking um that sort of in in the world at, at the moment there seems to be a lot of um yeah there just seems to be a lot of people who are very uh desperate to sort of go along with with what other people say and, and there seems to be a lot more pressure somehow i may be a bit too young to be saying this but that's just what i'm even over the last couple of years you know you just see with certain trends it's you know, it's kind of, the, the, there's so much nuance, I think, that, we, that we're missing out on. Uh, and it's just kind of, you know, you're with us or you're against us. And that kind of black and white thinking, which I think is, is really unhelpful in all, in all kind mm. of um, mm. spheres of life. Mm. Yes, there are lots of different kind of tribes, lots of different ideologies. But the, the thing that sort of un, unites them or, or the, the thing that makes them more insidious, in a sense, is that, that we're just all plugged in now you know it's it's we're, we're just plugged into the hive mind via social media via the internet um, uh, so information is all pervasive communication is all pervasive and that does kind of up the pressure towards um it, it creates echo chains it creates tribes and it and, it, and those those tribes um you know their feed is curated for them yeah um, and so that there's a lot of people operating in, in cults at the moment yeah and and essentially it's actually scary i know we're going slightly off topic now but it is it's scary how easy it is to potentially not hear from or speak to anyone who doesn't agree with you you know and i'm i'm feel that i'm fairly fortunate i've got a wide variety of friends and, and family who have who are very kind of open-minded and, and tolerant people, but uh, I'm just kind of becoming increasingly aware that uh, maybe that's not the case for everyone. And I think what I find quite refreshing about the fire movement is, um, is there does sort of seem to be an openness and it's just people who are willing to think a little bit differently about life. Yeah. Um, so I, the way I think about it is um, cats rather than sheep. I mean, when, when you, I mean, I write a blog, obviously. Um, and so I realized quite early on that people would disagree with me. I mean, you, you can write almost anything and, and people will disagree with you. And because financial independence attracts a greater share of cats rather than sheep, you know, you, they're, they're just independent thinkers. And so I can't sort of say, oh, I've got X, x thousand readers and I'll, I'll say this and then they'll all do that that's not how it works you know they it's like herding cats um you shouldn't even try yeah um, and so and so that i like i like that about it that's one of the things i like about it it's independent kind of people who are who are trying to be sort of logical ish um and who are trying to who have some awareness for the most part of, of our human flaws and our human weaknesses and our human biases. Yeah. Yeah. And also the art of disagreement as in, you know, it's okay to, to, to disagree with someone, you know, respectfully and, and, you know, that doesn't have to, you know, that doesn't have to mean that you're some sort of evil person, you know, if you don't agree with someone on a specific point. I think also I, I worry that we're, we're slightly losing that a little bit. And it's, uh, like you say, it's all very tribal and it's all very... You're kind well, of, you're it, you know, we all have it within ourselves. So I, I sometimes go back and read some of my old blog posts and think, oh, I, ooh, I'm, that's, that's, that's kind of crappy writing. Because I can see that it's written just from my own experience. And so I, I, one of the things that I've learned to guard against is what I call one true church syndrome. So I could write a blog saying, this is the escape artist official way to get to financial you must You must train, you must do a degree in economics, you must train as a child's accountant, you must go and work in finance, you must, you know, you must live in this part of London, da, da, da. you must do all this stuff and 
and then hey presto guaranteed route to uh, wealth and and happiness rubbish that's absolute rubbish you know there there's no one true path there's lots and lots of different ways to achieve financial independence and the the beauty of um the good thing about having a blog is that you you people get in touch with you and so i just hear lots of different people of all different types ages backgrounds different geographies you know who've found a found a way that works for them yeah and financial independence can mean different things to different people you know so for some you know there's difference between fat fire and lean fire and you know some people perhaps even just want to be able to work part-time and have you know a bit of a monthly income passive income that they've got coming in but they just want to be able to cut down their hours other people maybe perhaps do contract work or work in a freelance way which kind of gives them more flexibility and maybe they'll have a, a couple of months off every year or maybe they'll have sort of mini retirement so yeah there's definitely no sort of one way of, a, of achieving it but I suppose having said that, achieving financial independence in its traditional form, i.e. the way you did it in terms of building en up enough wealth so that you sort of don't have to uh, work at all if you, if you choose not to, for a lot of people that can seem like quite a tough mountain to climb and very much kind of an exercise in, in deferring gratification. So... If you're being honest, are there any downsides to achieving financial independence, such as maybe the compromises you had to make to achieve it? Um, and also, I'm kind of interested, particularly in your case, because you did work in a very kind of high powered job. How did you sort of stay motivated and, and sort of stay the course, so to speak, when your job was was very challenging? Yes. Good questions. So, um, I mean, did I sacrifice um, stuff? Of course, of course I did. Um, I, you know, I can't tell you how many arguments, you know, um, sorry, I mean discussions I had with my wife um, about, you know, what's the point of all this saving? You know, what's the point of all this frugality? Why can't we have what they've got? Why don't we spend what they spend, etc. So there's all those there's all those pressures. Um, you know, I missed I missed you know like school plays. I missed my daughter's school play once when she was eight, and she's never forgiven me for it. <laughs> it's a running joke in our household, like that. I'm the worst person in the world because I didn't go to her school play, and she's not wrong. Um, so so yeah, I mean, you there are there will there are always trade offs in life. There are always trade offs in life. Um, and that's why I kind of, um, I get irritated uh, if I see, I mean, I mean in, the, in, in its broadest sphere, if you kind of Google financial freedom or Google financial independence, you'll see a hell of a lot of bullshit. I mean, you'll see, you know, kind of people that have like rented a private jet and are taking pictures to post on their Instagram account. And they're like, you know, live the dream, trade FX, no sacrifice needed. And it's, it's, it's bullshit. Um, so there's always there's always trade-offs. Uh, there's always kind of um, there's always choices, um, and so I mean that's just just obviously the case. It's obviously the case. That anyone says it isn't is it's just insane or just lying. Um, but that's you know that's part of that's part of the beauty. Right? The the beauty of it is, as you said, it is a mountain to climb. I mean, it really is. Like when you start off at the bottom, um, you know, I started off broke. I have never inherited any money. Um, getting to financial independence did seem like a mountain to climb, but people do climb Everest. I mean, people do climb Everest. You don't even need to be particularly skilled to climb Everest. You just need to put one foot in front of the other until you get to the top. Um, and so in that sense, it absolutely is like um, climbing a mountain. And, you know, how, how, how do you eat an elephant? Like one chunk at a time. How do you climb a mountain one step at a time? To be fair, I'm not sure I massively want to eat an elephant, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, two really good points there. First of all, I, I agree. I think there are a lot of um, 
uh, I think there is a bit of bullshitting, uh, definitely in is, or it can attract certain people who perhaps want to exploit people's desperation to make money. Um, and yeah, you always seeing adverts for you know trading. You know, I made fifty thousand pounds in one day, and all this kind of business. And then, but you should see my YouTube ads. I mean, the ads that YouTube thinks that I want to watch. It's, it's a horror show. It's an absolute horror show. We go from Bitcoin trading to FX trading to options trading to like start your dream life. Like, and that's what that's what YouTube thinks I want to watch because it's somehow picked up on the fact that I watch stuff related to financial independence. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've ended up seeing quite a lot of those adverts just because of the kind of obviously the content that I create and the content that I watch as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh yeah, you get lots of sort of the kind of lifestyle adverts and, oh, would you like to, you know, here's how I, you know, made such X amount of money. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure some of them are legitimate, I'm sure. But hmm. the, 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 the trick is to just try to enjoy the journey and try to make baby steps every day whereby you're getting you know you're moving in the right direction so to, to me I, I hate this kind of binary thinking whereby you know you're uh, it's a success when you're uh, when you've quit and you never work again and anything else is a failure or you know you haven't you haven't achieved financial independence i, I, I really just don't like that way of thinking at all to, to me is like are, are you are you improving are you learning are you getting closer to your own personal goals whatever they are and, and if you do that regularly every day, um, you know, you, you benefit from what I call uh, the aggregation of marginal gains. Like it adds up and turn and amazing things become possible. But it kind of amazing things start to become possible after about 10 years of hard work. Yeah. So is that how you sort of manage to kind of keep yourself motivated, even on perhaps days when you thought, bloody hell, this job is really hard work. And uh, you know, I, I don't want to be here, you know, as, as we all do, let's be blunt. We all have those kind of days, don't we? Um, is it very much a case of you sort of looked at the, the small things to a certain extent on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? And, um, yeah, well, um, for the last few years, my job was so insanely busy that I didn't really have much time to think. And, and in some ways that was a blessing. It, it, it just, it was just, all out go 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 and so I, di I didn't have time to be unhappy <laughs> like, you know, I didn't I didn't have time to sort of sort of do too much navel gazing or contemplation it was like so li literally the way I used to think was can I get through today can I get through today and then you know can I get through? I've got I've got to catch a flight at whatever 5 30 tomorrow can I possibly make my flight um, and that's that, you know, so I spare myself some kind of navel gazing by keeping myself busy. And so, um, you know, work, work is a, work can be a, a very powerful force for good. You know, work can be a very powerful distraction. Um, work has got these whole, work's like a video game. It's got all these carrots and sticks. It's got all these incentives for going up a level, going up a level. That's essentially promotion is go, like going up a level in a video game. And video games are very, very absorbing. And so one way in which, you know, one way you can kind of make the journey easier is by becoming a workaholic. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying, you know, that, that workaholism is a, is a helpful trait. <laughs> Um, in that sense um, but again like at some point you have to say what are my true values you know is this getting me where I want to be and what's what's it all for yeah uh, definitely not having time to think I agree with you I think it's probably a bit of a blessing uh, I'm a bit of an overthinker unfortunately um, and uh, I don't think it does me much good most of the time so um, so but yeah you know the, the, the thing the thing you can do there is, uh, is is kind of manage your own state, manage your own thought process, and you know if you do have uh, if you've got to work work this just a deadline. There's nothing like a deadline for kind of that that incredible focus and shutting out everything else. Yeah. 
but what if you don't have that for whatever reason you can just go and throw yourself into something analogous to that so you so if i'd had a like a classic nine to five job i probably would have become like a fitness fanatic out you know before nine and after and after five just to throw myself into weight training or cycling or, or stuff like that yeah and i suppose where that's you know a lot of people particularly in fire circles who do have perhaps more traditional nine to five jobs you know i suppose side hustles can be a, another great use of um time if if you've got an idea you know which is actually going to make you money and you're going to enjoy sort of doing on the side i suppose i thought it was really interesting that you you talked about how you sort of brought your family on board with financial independence because i think if i was to be a little bit critical of the, the fire movement is I think it can be very much focused on people as individuals, forgetting that, you know, a lot of people, uh, not everyone, of course, but a lot of people are in relationships. Some people have children and it's, it's, you know, when you're in a relationship, you do also have to think about that other person. When you've got kids, you've got to think about, you know, that, that balance of, of, of paying for them and kind of giving them what's reasonable without, spoiling them and, and keeping um you know and keeping your financial independence goals but i think it's it's really interesting and i really appreciate your honesty there actually because i don't that's not a side that we hear very much of we tend to hear of kind of individual success stories and i i think it's always helpful to be aware of the fact that there are challenges along the way and that people also have to consider you know dependents and wives and husbands and and partners and it's always a bit of a negotiation i think anyway um in terms of how you achieve your goal and, and how you achieve and how you bring your family um sort of with you on that goal really yes i mean one of the one of the a great way to destroy your chances of getting to financial independence is marry the wrong person <laughs> yeah well so exactly well i had a, i had a female coaching client and she was like a high flyer and she just had to pay like alimony to her useless ex-husband. And it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> that's, that's, that's like ridiculous. Yeah, divorce is very expensive. So if you can avoid it, <laughs> then do. Um, so now that you've achieved financial independence, obviously I know quite a lot about the, uh, your blog, The Escape Artist, but I'd definitely like you to elaborate on that. What kind of projects are you up to? What do you do to, to fill your time? Um, yes, I write. Um, I, I do coaching um, for, for people, um, sometimes in the workplace, actually. Um, so. Um, I do I do kind of private client coach, coaching, but sometimes I get asked to go in, go in, ironically go in back into the prison camp, as I call it. And, They've and invited you back in. It's it's I know I kind of sneak under the wire. I mean it's it's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I do that. Um, I um, you know I do spend a lot of time on kind of fitness. Um, as, as well and they're always kind of little sort of projects sort of bubbling up at any one point in time so I'm you know I'm, my, I'm talking to someone about making a, a course about financial literacy that would be sort of like a video online learning thing um, so I don't know if that will happen or not but I'm talking about that at the moment. It sounds like sort of really interesting side projects that you work on what kind of gave you the idea for the blog? It's it's a really great title, by the way. I because it's it's very resonant. You know, we are all, yeah, the escape artists, right? We're all trying to, to a certain extent, escape the the confines of a uh, structured work. Yeah, well, I I found the Mister Money Moustache blog, and it just blew my blew me away. I was like, why? This is amazing. This is absolutely brilliant. So when I found that um, in 2013, I, I was just like, why, why is no one writing something like this in the UK? This is absolute genius. And my first reaction was, oh, here's this guy who says he retired at 30. 
uh, and now he's living the dream. You know, like I'm, I'm literally checking my wallet, you know, in case someone's ripping me off. Um, like, so where's the catch? Where's the catch? So I, I read all of it, looking for the catch, and you know, and I, I couldn't find it. And I, the more I read, the more I was like, oh, the numbers actually stack up, you know. Um, it's like it's hilarious when people, you know, you see people agonising over the four percent safe withdrawal rate, um, for example, because I'd worked in finance for twenty years. When, when I stumbled across all of this debate about the, the, the safe withdrawal rate, I just immediately knew that oh, that made sense. That, that made sense. Like, you know, the idea that you can live off 4% a year, it's not a high, it wasn't a stretch of the imagination for me when I'd been seeing you know, private equity firms get 30% a year. I'd seen, you know, um, you know, with risk obviously and blow ups along the way. When I'd seen the stock market do 10% a year, um, I just knew that the four percent year that four percent concept made sense. So I stumbled across all this stuff, and I'm like, "This is this is this is quality content, and this is stuff that the public needs to know." And why on earth is there not some version of Mr. Money Moustache in the UK? So I literally emailed um, Mr. Money Moustache saying. Um, Here's a blog post that I wrote for you about getting to financial independence in the UK. And he emailed me back saying, I'm not going to publish your blog post. Um, so I've already written something like that. Um, but why don't you start, you know, why don't you just start a blog in the UK um, on, the, on the same lines? And so I did. Ah, so it was Mr. Money Moustache who, who gave you the idea. Um, and he, how, told, he told me to do it. It's his fault. He, he gave you his blessing. Um, and how how long have you had the blog for now, Barney? Uh, about six years. Ah, okay. Um, and it's interesting you talk about your financial coaching. Uh, well, the coaching that you do when you go into people's workplace is that kind of around um, finances and and how. I've, or is, I mean, I presume it's not around how people can retire early, but I mean, I can imagine some companies may be incredibly. So uh, here's what I do. Here's what I do. I go in and I give a talk about financial independence, but just without talking about early retirement. So it's just all about good money management. It's all about not being scared of the stock market. It's all about um, being smart with your money, not being suckered by consumerism paying yourself first, tracking your spending, kind of, you know, all of those, all of those just basic principles of good financial management. And I just, I just, I just leave out the bit about, oh, you know, you, you know, you quitting your, quitting your job. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, I think that's honest because you don't, you know, it, I, I started writing a fire blog, not a fire blog. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The emphasis should, I think, for me anyway, is on financial independence rather than the traditional idea of, of retirement and, I don't know, playing golf every day. Um, for me, it's I still want to do things, but I want to have control over what I do and when I do, and I want to be able to explore different projects and collaborations and, and opportunities rather than sort of someone else effectively um sort of tell me what to do and tell me how i should do it and you know tell me how i should think and and uh, all the sort of other levels of control which um you can sort of naturally imbibe when when you're an employee and i suppose a bit of a halfway house to that is 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 working for yourself um is sort of being a freelancer or contractor well i i honestly i honestly believe that the biggest so financial independence is basically um it's kind of what's one description i like of it it's, it's a it's an environmental movement dressed up as a get rich scheme so what hooks people's attention is that oh you too can be rich and you too can retire at, at 30 or you too can do this um and live the dream so that's what hooks people's attention but what i the way i see it is the biggest benefits of walking that path come early on. The biggest benefits are when you pay off your credit card debt. Um, and then the next biggest benefit 
is when you pay off your car loan. And then the next biggest benefit is when you've got three months cash emergency fund. And then the next benefit is when you kind of sort out your 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 pension at work and where the money's going. And the next benefit is where you you know open up a, a Vanguard account or something like that. In other words, that's those are huge, huge positive steps forward. And then, but the actual moment when you go from having 24.9 times your annual spending to 25.1 times your uh, annual spending, that's not a big deal. That's really interesting. And I think for a lot of people, even just having an emergency fund is, is a massive uh, achievement because I'm always constantly staggered by how many people who are on good salaries, um, you know, 60, 70 grand or whatever, well above average income, and they don't have any savings. Well, as soon as I saw the Mr. Money Moustache blog, what, what I'm thinking is, oh my goodness. I mean, the implications of this are so powerful across society. Not because, you know, a handful of weird, geeky software guys can, you know, live in their trailer or live in their kind of little tiny house, you know, and do nothing from the age of 30 other than write, tap shit into a computer. Right? That's, that to me was not the, 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 the magic bit. The magic bit is, oh my goodness, what if everyone got out of debt? What if everyone had an emergency fund? Yeah, and I think especially, um, so for watchers, we're recording this as the UK is easing out of uh, lockdown for the COVID-19 pandemic. But, you know, there will be a lot of people uh, who are on furlough or even not on furlough who will not have jobs at the end of all of this. And, you know, what a difference having three to six months worth of your salary saved, you know, at, at a point like this when potentially going to go into recession, um, to, to not having that money. And it's been the ultimate case study of why you should have a, an emergency fund. That's what COVID has been. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Anyway, so I'm going to finish with my final question, and it's always the same, which is what surprised you most about achieving financial independence? Well, it's that it's the point around, you know, you still you still need something to do. So it's um, it's very easy to fall into the trap when you're kind of um, climbing the mountain of think, thinking everything will be solved when I get to the top of the mountain. And, and actually in mountaineering, that is a thing. In, seri in serious mountaineering, that is called summit fever. So a lot of people die, more, m many more people die on the way down. coming down Everest than they do on the way up. Because on the way up, there's, people are very, very focused. Um, and so the, the financial independence equivalent of that is you still need a reason to get out of bed in the morning, you know, when, um, when you've kind of quit your job. And so for me, just living through that experience um, has just hammered home for me that um, it's not, it's, you don't just kind of hit the magic sunlit uplands one day and, and live happily ever after. But how, how did it feel though on that first, I'm presuming you had that sort of first day, was that, was there a sort of a bit of a jubilation at that day or was it more of, I'm just going to not set my alarm and, you know, I'm just going to do whatever I want for the day? Yeah, so um, it, it was, um, you know, de decompression, is, um, decompression is a thing. So um, I think it takes about, um, well, it took me sort of three to six months to kind of slowly decompress from from work and just kind of ease into that new way of thinking and so um it's wonderful not to set an alarm clock and a very very big win and a very quick win is um from achieving financial independence is just getting eight or nine hours of sleep to which, to which someone might say, well, you don't actually need to get to financial independence to get eight or nine hours of sleep. And I'd say, you're right, you're absolutely right. So kind of riddle, riddle me that.
Um, but but yeah, t- the, it is a one I enjoyed. I, I personally quite like binge working and then having a break and then sort of finding a new project. I don't. I personally don't believe humans are machines, and we're not built to to work steady state nine to five five days a week for 50 years that's for lathes and photocopiers that's not for like organic human beings Um, yeah i agree so i so my my experience was kind of sprint to the finish um you know don't set the alarm clock um just you know take it easy for a few months and, and kind of start to figure it out that is a brilliant way to end our show thank you very much Barney. you've been a really interesting guest and hopefully listeners and, and watchers um can take some useful hints and tips from your story my pleasure thank you for having me thank you thank you for listening if you've enjoyed this interview then please do subscribe to my channel